We're all ready. Good afternoon. As I was saying, let's proceed with the fourth round table. Today, it's the 85th anniversary that my uncle Manel survived an explosion of a truck full of explosive in a um, flat in Balmes Street, 11, number 11. So for me, it's a very important day. And we're going to talk about uh, the memory, which is in construction, memory and citizens. And to talk about that, we have four speakers, experts on the topic that will provide us with their vision. I'm going to introduce them. Uh, as you can see them, but they are going to move in order to be next to the computer and be able to go through their presentation. They will have 20 minutes for their initial presentation, and, and let's see if we have time in the end for a Q&A session. Probably the audience will have questions or remarks. First of all, we have Kay Hain. He is a tourist operation manager at Berlin Underworlds Association. It is an association preserving the memory of uh, underground Berlin. They organize guided tours uh, to the underground Berlin since uh, um, they, and they have been doing that for decades, so they have a long experience. Peppa Pascual, she's an archaeologist at the archaeology section of Valencia City Council. She has participated in all processes of uh, preservation and some sign posting, sign posting of memory places in the city. So she's going to tell about this initi initiative. Jose Maria Contel, journalist, historian, probably most of you know him as he has been a person working on memory issues, particularly in the Gracia neighborhood and shelters. He um, was one of the persons that discovered the shelter at the Generalitat uh, Palace in the government of Catalonia, and he's the author of several publications. And next to me, we have Daniele Maruca. He's Italian, but he lives in Berlin, and he is the director of the Fuerle Collection. It's an art center located in an old telecommunications bunker in Berlin. And he's going to tell us about the different uses we can give to memory places. We will follow the order you have in the program. So Kay will have the floor first. This is why he's sitting by the computer. So Kay, the floor Thank is you, yours. Thank uh, you for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, before I start, a few words. Uh, I'm very happy to, to be here. This, the last two days have been uh, very informative, very educative for me. And so therefore I'm a little bit nervous because I speak of so much uh, experts here. Um, yeah, but let's come to the Berlin Unterwelten, which I'm standing here for. Uh, Berlin Underworlds. Um, and I guess you see that we try to play a little bit with the myth of underworld and uh, what's come with the theme even from the uh, antique times. Uh, yeah, um, but before we go to the underworld, um, let's speak a little bit about Berlin, which is uh, my theme, our theme. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, Barcelona and, and uh, the, um, the shelters have been built here. Um, if I'm doing my speech, um, mixing up the words bunker and sheltered, uh, the thing is in German, bunker is an enforced building, doesn't have to have a weapon on that. Uh, every other thing we called house Luftschutzkeller, Luftschutzdeckungsgraben, something like that, uh, but not a bunker, so, so, therefore I'm sorry. Okay, uh, so um, those who have uh, listened to Wieland yesterday, he told you that Pre-war, there have been not, nearly nothing built as uh, shelters. And then after the first air raids um, over Berlin, uh, there was this order from Hitler. Everybody's in a dictatorship. Everybody's waiting for the big boss to make decisions. And so uh, the Führer-Sofort-Programm für die Reichshauptstadt. Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry for this 
nice German words. But, uh, it's, um, yeah, the, the leaders uh, immediately programmed to build bunkers in Berlin, and it was especially for Berlin, and about 1,000 um, bunkers, in reinforced concrete buildings had been planned. Um, as far as we know, about 628, we have proved that they have been built. Um, and we expect that not more than 800 have been built uh, in this program. Um, and this program was heavily forced to build very fast, and um, therefore they tried to use existing structures, like one uh, I will talk about later, or they built whole new bunkers. First they started under the ground, and then they noticed oh, under the ground digging is very difficult, and it's cheaper to build over the ground. And there's one thing about you have to know about Berlin. Berlin, it's uh, standing on sand and water. So if you go to the Brandenburg Gate, which you have at least seen, all of you, and then dig a hole after two and a half meters, you're standing in the groundwater, even today with this uh, bad um, climate situation and uh, the lack of rain. Um, anyway, you, you can't dig a hole there because of the American embassy, but uh, that's another thing. Um, so um, that's the thing we talk about, and we are in Germany, and so they tried to build this as efficient as possible. So what they did is uh, they tried to use underground structures still ex um, existing at this moment, or they built type bunkers. So they had architects who have nothing else to do than to invent types of bunkers with a special um, ideas of smaller or bigger rooms with one, two, four, five levels, uh, bunkers especially for the, for the, for the railroad passengers, uh, bunkers for companies, and so on and so on. Um, yeah, that's, oh, we had even um, operation, uh, surgery bunkers. Uh, we have um, 25 have been planned in Berlin, 15 have been built. Um, if you look today for these bunkers, you will notice that um, many, many of them are not existing anymore because about 80% of them have been destroyed. Uh, because Berlin, like I guess you know, um, was after the war um, occupied by four alleys and then later then divided in east and west. And um, in Potsdam, they made the decision Germany must be demilitarized. And if you have a bunker, you have the ability to protect yourself against an air raid, so you can come to the conclusion, oh, I can drop bombs on my neighbor. And so they said, okay, we destroy the bunker, so the Germans won't drop bombs on their neighbors anymore. And that's the reason about 80% of the bunkers in Berlin have been destroyed. But Berlin was the only city <laughs> which they did that. In other German cities, they're still existing till today. Uh, so, and the city of uh, Bremerhaven, actually, Today, they have these old World War II bunkers. They're still there, and they could about shelter about 25% of the people with these old bunkers. But anyway, um, that's the reason why you don't find so much of them anymore. And then there was a time of dividing the city, um, especially the western part used these bunkers. Uh, Wieland had showed you one of those uses. I like to use them as a storage facility for the Berlin res Senate Reserve. Um, and then came the, 1900, the year 1989, the wall was falling down, uh, 1990 Berlin and Germany was reunited, and then a lot of spaces which have been prohibited to go there were open. And I can assure you I have lived there in this time when I was 14, when the reunification was there, it was a time of great freedom. It's like a little bit of anarchy. Um, if you look back today, so you could do a lot of things which you couldn't do anymore today. Um, mostly thanks to the police. Um, and so, oh, one thing I forgot, sorry. Uh, one step back, during the war, everybody who had a house was um, forced to have a house Luftschutzkeller, a shelter in the house. This picture actually is from the anti-war museum in Berlin. I take this from my colleagues there. Um, they have a very good and very powerful exhibition about not to go to the war. Um, in Berlin, nobody knows exactly how many of these bunk uh, shelters, sorry, this is a shelter, uh, had been existing. Uh, we calculate more than 100,000 have been there in the houses. But because of the gentrification and the remodernization of houses, they're not existing anymore. Perhaps you find one or two. Actually, 
in my house in Neuköllnus. Still, the door at least is there. Okay, good. So let's come to the uh, association. Uh, in the early night, uh, sorry, um, yes, to make a microphone. Uh, in the early 90s, um, a few guys and girls, even girls, have been there at this moment. Um, they're researching underground structures not only from the Nazi time, but even from the times before, for, from the Weimar Republic time or from the Kaiserreich time. And uh, a lot of cellars, basements, um, I don't know if you heard about this uh, um, techno club, Tresor. No, none of you, okay. Um, uh, it was a, one of the famous clubs in the city. Actually, the room was smaller than this one. The ceiling was slighter and uh, slower, than, uh, deeper than this one here. And about 250, 300 people dancing inside it was a nice time. Uh, this was the old resort uh, from the uh, from the Kaufhaus uh, Wertheim, and it was uh, next to the wall, so nobody was going inside between 1961 and 1989. And so this was, uh, this was a time when these kind of places were we, uh, discovered. And my colleagues have been there, and uh, they always see each other or see traces of each other. And so then they connect together, and then they made an association in 1997 to research and to protect. Because in the middle of the 90s, Berlin became the capital and the parliament uh, seat of Germany. And then they start to build, especially in inner city areas, and now all these old stuff should be gone away, because it's in the way for new buildings. And there is something about Berlin, uh, unfortunately, it's still to, till today, we try to not use our memory. Um, in Berlin, um, some um, writer sometimes uh, at, at one point says, Berlin is a city who is uh, doomed to uh, always to will be, but not to be. And so we, we try always to be something but we don't look back and see, okay, that's where we are. And so that was uh, the main reason for my colleagues to found the association, to change the mind of the city and to hold the memory, uh, something that Wieland even do to on his ways. Um, the nearly the first reaction from the government of Berlin was, oh, they're just a bunch of uh, bunker kissing and uh, concrete loving criminals who try to enter Hitler's bunker. Hitler's bunker is not existing anymore, anyway. Um, so it, it took us about 25 years, but now at least parts of the government see that we, try, that we really do in a, hopefully a good job. Um, and many, many things we do in the underground, especially the research and the protecting um, uh, services, is a volunteer work. So it's uh, people who like to do this and who are craving to hold our memory um, intact. Um, doing our research, um, uh, we, we had visit uh, members uh, that's... Um, do, you, do you see that? Uh, do you see the, the last lines in 2022? Okay, so and that's a number of our members. Um, so about 500 people, uh, more or less, in the last years, uh, doing many, many of the work. But we do even work in the uh, in the association because we're making um, um, yeah, we're making uh, we, um, experts uh, making. Um, speeches um, about uh, certain themes and uh, since uh, the pandemic we even stream that uh, so you can find us on YouTube on this point um, and that's what we do and uh, the main important thing we do and that's what I do since uh, more than 20 years now um, is we're doing tours tours for tourists for Berliners everybody who'd like to come to us and um, so what you see here is a, a number of visitors who have come to us in the last um, 25 years. In the, background, in the background, you see the tunnel of one of these um, um, subways uh, should have been built under the, um, under the tear garden for uh, the Germania plan for Hitler and Speer, but that's another thing. Uh, we can talk about one and a half hour. Um, so you see the pandemic hits us a little bit. <laughs> at this point, uh, but now we are back to a point where we can work um, secure, safe, and uh, where we can get uh, cash money for our projects. So, so yeah, we don't do that for our pocket, we do that uh, to, yeah, to 
bring it back to the bunkers and to the shelters and to the tunnels, everything we have. And doing this uh, work, we even discover sometimes interesting things, uh, some things um, long forgotten for many pe people in Berlin. Um, what you see here, um, these drawers, you see a so-called Adrema drawers. Adrema is a German short. We have long words with nice abbreviations. Um, address, uh, addressier machine, address machine. Um, and on these cards, uh, the zinc metal plates, uh, where the names and addresses of um, the employees from a company, as in, in this case, the Telefunken in Tempelhof, um, next to the Temple of Harbor, not, ne not to mix with the Temple of Airport. And um, about uh, 15,000 cards, about 3,500 had the names of the slave laborers who were forced to work for Telefunken during the war between the 41 and 45. And um, during the war, more than 300,000 people um, have been forced to work in Berlin in every imaginable way, from um, building bunkers to being the nanny for some SS men. Um, and uh, more than 1,000 camps for these people had been existing in the city. And if you go today, you find nearly no traces. And so uh, between 2003 and 2012, we even had a, a theater group um, playing um, a project playing in our bunker, in one of our bunkers, uh, and trying to reimagine and to relive these, uh, the, the faith of these people. And the most uh, who played there were young um, people. Most of them was, my, uh, was uh, in Germany called them Migrationshintergrund. Uh, so people who are migrating or their parents have been migrating or grandparents in this case um, to Berlin. So it was part of our, you can say community work um, in that and even to, yeah, to hold the memory. Today there's actually a memorial for these people in uh, Schöneweide. That's uh, even that's, um, Partly, I hope, because of our work, um, because of publicity we bring in that. Um, another thing is that we lose our heritage. Uh, since the beginning, um, sometimes the only thing that our, uh, my colleagues could do is go in these bunkers, go in the shelters, uh, making at least pictures, making uh, the research uh, like you, you do as an archaeologist. Uh, sorry, that's a word I can't, cannot spell in English. Um, uh, archaeologist. Um, um, and then these are gone. This example here at the Alexanderplatz, which is uh, really, it's an interesting thing, it can do in half an hour or two about that. Um, it's still existing, but it won't be existing in three years, because then they will build a new apartment block, um, it's, uh, correct me, but it's 55 meters, no, 50, 50 levels high, about that. No, not 50. 34, 30, 34, 35 levels, but anyway, in high, really high building at the Alexanderplatz, everything will be uh, uh, built up. So that's what you see. And the interesting thing is, what you see, you have different layers, just on these five pictures, you have different layers of history. Um, the first on the, on, the, on the left side is uh, coming from a cellar from the Nazi time. Uh, then level down uh, is, um, and the door you see coming from World War II, from 1940, 1941, when the bunker was, um, should have sheltered three and a half thousand people. We have about 10 to 15,000 inside at the end of the war. And then you see the uh, upper right uh, picture. This is um, uh, the preparation of the GDR in the 1960s when they tried to reuse the bunker, which they then stopped. They didn't know because uh, all the materials are gone, uh, all the documents. So we only have the structures and we will lose the structures. And this is just one example of uh, what we try to do. Um, in the meantime, um, the uh, 3D technology is so well uh, um, that we uh, um, uh, have um, a company here in Berlin, in Berlin um, with making laser scans of um, all the structures we have at least access to, so at least we can pr um, save this data uh, for future uses, and we um, a actually we are trying to develop a small exhibition about um, lost places uh, at, in Berlin. Uh, and yeah, let's come at the end to uh, our news project, uh, uh, which we really started last year, uh, Dresdner Straße in Berlin Mitte, um, and. Um, 
So it was originally designed, I will sh um, um, I'll show you uh, some uh, ske uh, sketches in, uh, in a second. It was originally designed to be a subway tunnel. It started, they started to build that in 1930, they finished it in 19, uh, 1913, they started in 1930, they, they finished. Uh, First, at here at the moment, you see, okay, do you need really 17 years to build one small tunnel about four, 500 meters long? Uh, no, but you're in Berlin. Um, some, do you have about our airport? Okay, always the same. Um, um, then in 1941-43, when most parts of that was made in a, in a shelter, after the war, Berlin was divided, and this tunnel goes from Berlin Mitte to Berlin Kreuzberg. Kreuzberg was American sector, West Berlin, Mitte, East Berlin, uh, Soviet sector. So it was, became part of the Berlin Wall. And then the station, we lost the station in 2015. Um, and I will tell you in a second why, which is a very odd reason. And then 2022, so last year, we got a chance to enlist the building as an heritage and to get a um, contract to use the building because it's still, and it's, it's part of this governmental owned buildings under the ground, uh, under the streets. Um, come on. Oh yeah, so now we have here um, the plan of that. Um, I could talk for hours about that, but just for short, uh, you, you see the blue lines, um, that's the part uh, which we lost now, but uh, the, uh, this was originally designed to be a station. This was not built because um, the big um, Wertheim uh, um, Kaufhaus, uh, shopping, shopping center, say shopping center, uh, spent a lot of money to uh, get the, um, the station from the blue point to the cross you see in the middle. Uh, the Moritzplatz, um, so they just they changed the plan for the Kaufhaus. Um, the red lines you see are the, the border between East and West Berlin, um, just to give an orientation. Um, and uh, the green lines uh, showing this part of the structure which was at, uh, built to shelter in the second place. Okay, yeah, okay, I'll try to. Um, and I don't know if you see that, but there is, on, on, the, um, on the lower part, there is a small lilac line. Do you see that? Yeah? Remember that for later. So that's the building we lost, the station Oranienstraße, uh, Oranienplatz. Um, this was built, and you see even the, uh, the, uh, by Alfred Grenander, he was, uh, no, by Peter Behrens, um, the main architect of the AG, which was a big company in Berlin, uh, which even built this line, or the first parts of the line. Uh, because it was not used as a station, it was then used as an uh, electric um, supply from the um, public um, uh, uh, electric company. And then in 2015, it was uh, destroyed and filled with concrete, and the reason is, well, they calculated the roof could not take any more two trucks with 30 tons, each of them. So it means what the government wanted is that a tank, a German tank, could go over this bunker. Don't know if that's really needed today, but that's the reason why they destroyed that. And even when we ask them not to do, we will try to, to get the money to reinforce the building. They said, no, we want to get rid of that. And that's the thinking, we have to work on it in Berlin. Uh, okay, and then, yeah, just a few pictures. Um, they are not so clear because we are uh, still trying to, um, to clean the mess inside. But here, a few pictures um, of the interior. If you look closely, you see there's a lot of water inside. Or at least, to be, to be honest, it was. Uh, so that's what we do in the last um, a few months. To bring out the water, bring out the debris, bring in the archaeologists uh, to research the whole thing. Here you see my colleagues on working. In the background, you see um, the tunnel from the U8 and the connection, and uh, you see we're cleaning everything out. But what you see is even a lot of uh, tags and graffiti on there. That's a big problem for us uh, in this uh, bunker. We will try to um, get rid of a few of them, but we can't take everything away. We will um, document uh, them at least as pictures, and um, even that is a layer of history which is there, and so therefore we will leave some of them 
uh, we will leave there. Others will be taken away because we need the layers behind that. Um, and, oh yeah, you remember the Lilac uh, line? That's the last part of Berlin Wall still standing in place intact. Uh, unfortunately, and we don't know exactly when, about 2010 to 2012, somebody tried to pick a hole inside. Uh, they don't come very far because there is um, um, a steel plate behind it. Uh, on, the other, on the left picture, you, perhaps you can see that, um, there is a uh, wooden stick and connected with that is um, wire, signal wires, and they were put on the wall and so the, uh, the soldiers should get a signal if somebody tried to go through this wall. So um, the archaeologist had been there, had been saved and everything, and we will try to reconstruct that in place and later in show. So that's what we do. Uh, most things we do as tourists are like tours in the Cold War bunkers, uh, tours in the first tunnel ever built in Berlin. We even built new tunnels to show the people escape tunnels when people try to build tunnels under the wall to escape from east to west. So we even built a new tunnel. <laughs> We spend a lot of money for that. <laughs> and we even do some other things. We even may pay for excavations. Uh, in the Humboldt Hain, you see this old picture is a bull, a statue of a bull, uh, which was standing there uh, since the late 19th century. Um, in, the wall, uh, in the war, in the last days of the war, it was destroyed and then forgotten. And then uh, one of my colleagues came to an article in a, in a local newspaper, and then we started the research, and then we found it, and now we have it. And the, um, the, uh, some people in, in the Gartenbauamt, so the authorities for the park, don't really like the idea that we uh, have a statue that perhaps should be in the park again. Uh, so we still have a few discussions about that, uh, but that's what we do. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, hola, buena tarde. Muchas gracias por convidarme. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me. I like Barcelona very much. My name is Daniele Maruca, and um, I'm very happy to be here um, representing uh, the Feuerle Collection, which is a private museum in Berlin. So you can imagine that we, we zoom in from the globe into Berlin, and um, actually the area in which uh, the uh, museum of the Feuerle Collection is located is very close to the Berlin uh, story bunker uh, you heard about yesterday. It's the, the area of, uh, of, of a canal, which is called Landwehr Canal, which is actually quite important as an area for um, former bunkers of uh, the Reichsbahn, of the railway system from uh, World War II. Um, but before I start, I want to say something very quickly. It's actually very unusual for us to talk about the building from the viewpoint of its history as a bunker, because in the first place, the Feuerle Collection is a museum with a very, very special collection by Desiree Feuerle, and um, with pieces um, juxtaposed with each other from uh, Khmer sculptures from the 7th to the 13th century, imperial Chinese furniture from the Han Dynasty, 200 BC until the early Qin Dynasty, early 17th century, international contemporary art, and actually it's a total artwork. So it's the first time that we really go deeper into the history of the building, and we do it with you. I'm very happy that we can do it together in this context, which is academic and very, um, very multi-layered. Um, so now I have, I, yes. So Desiree Feuerle and Sarah Pucci um, founded the Feuerle collection in 2016. Um, and um, ever since that moment, um, in the Berlin art landscape, something very unusual has been added. Um, a, a place, a museum, where the art pieces are not described uh, academically, but um, a, an, an experience of art in the space, including the space of the bunker, 
creates a very meditative and very unique um, uh, Gesamtkunstwerk, total artwork, and performative approach. The pieces come from the collection, the private collection of Desire Feuerle. You see him um, on the left. And um, uh, he has been working for decades on um, putting together not only the single pieces, but um, a very complex system of um, emotive and aesthetic, uh, emotional and aesthetic connections between times and regions of the world. Um, breaking with some of the more um, established rules in art history to offer a new perspective and to, uh, on, on, on ancient and contemporary art and to offer to the people the chance to discover their own approach to pieces which are coming from his private collection but then in the moment in which they are make it made accessible thanks to the initiative with Sarah Pooch, his wife, to open parts of the collection to the public, um, then they discover, the public discovers their own approach towards the pieces without interference. Um, the building is very impressive, but um, as I heard um, also from the other presentation, and you, as you all heard, um, collectively bunkers in a city like Berlin are charged with a lot of um, expectations, memories, uh, there's a special aura around them. And um, in fact, for the bunker of the Feuerle collection, this is um, only partially true because many Berliners who come to us for the first time, they say, well, we pass every day on this street, but we never saw this building. So it is a bunker because, as my colleague explained before, bunker in German doesn't refer to the function of a shelter for people, but to the architectural and engineeristic structure how the building is built. So it is classically a bunker because it has the ceiling is 3.5 meters thick, it's still concrete. The outer walls are 2.5 meters thick, it's still concrete, and it develops in two uh, floors under the ground. There's a first lower ground floor and a second lower ground floor. And um, it was created to stand against attacks. But it's not a shelter for people, it was not built as a shelter for people. And uh, in fact, it was not chosen as a seat for the Feuerle collection because it is a bunker. Because the founders, and especially uh, Desire Feuerle in, in his vision, was open to any kind of building, and also not only lo looking for it in the city of Berlin. Parallelly, he declared in many interviews he was looking in Istanbul, in Venice. Uh, he would have also uh, been maybe interested in a factory building or in an abandoned ship or in a monastery, he said, in, pal in a palazzo in, Vene in Venice. So he was not looking for a bunker because of the fascination of the bunker as a building, because of the history of the building, but because of the sculptural nature of this, and in this picture you can see it very well, it looks like a sculpture by Donald Judd. It looks like a sculpture by the most iconic conceptual minimalistic art, uh, artists of the 20th century. And, and then it has also another characteristic which is very different from other shelters. These are historical pictures you can find on Google. It's how it looked before the restoration. This is how it looks now. This is how it looked before the restoration. This is how it looks now. This is a garden on the roof now. I will tell you everything about this because now the bunker, although it's keeping its characteristics on the historical and architectural surface, it became a living organism and a green building. And I will tell you everything about it. But what I want to say is this is the uniqueness of this kind of bunker, a baza, Bunker, uh, which is a, 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 a Bahn Selbstanschlussanlage, it's, it's a self-connecting uh, device, uh, a communication device uh, of, of the railway system, which was very unique. It was developed actually by Siemens uh, very early, and it was one of the 
very special things the uh, Reichsbahn could count on in managing the communications within the railway system in north uh, west uh, in northeast uh, Germany and f there were four of these uh, bunkers with this kind of uh, devices one was in Berlin it was the most important one but then it was New Nuremberg Munich and Cologne and um, so it's not small rooms and low ceilings which is what normally we would expect is very high ceiling from 3.5 to 4 meters high and very large generous rooms so it's actually a sculpture from the outside it has many sculptures inside as you see if you look at the columns and it has a lot of space to give to the art pieces space and when i had the honor to meet this couple and uh, it was the, the year 2013, the first time, I was so impressed by the fact that although it was not yet looking like you see in this picture, it was very clear for Desiree Feuerle how it will look, and it was very clear that he had for this building a very special dream. I now go back to one aspect which I would say for the building itself, we also started talking about this very recently before we didn't do, is very important. Um, Apollo magazine in 2016 wrote something very nice. Um, they said um, the, the work by Desiree Feuerle and John Pozen, the architect who helped and worked with him on the adaptation of the, bu of the building to the new function, brought a meditative element into a building which was actually built for the hysteria of war. And it became something completely different. Indeed, it is not only different because of the content, which we'll see in a few seconds, but it's really, it became a living animal. It's actually a building with a heart made of water, with a head made of grass, of the most sophisticated and most natural grass there is, the North Sea grass. And it has walls which are breathing the temperature in a rhythm of six weeks, in and out, and many living organs. You, you, you all see them schematically in this graphic that I prepared. Um, but I will tell you more in the, into detail. But anyways, it became a living body. And in this living body, there are incredible pieces of art. Um, sometimes I have this. Uh, yeah, so um, about the concept, and I try to be quicker because I know we don't have time. Um, people enter the building. They don't know what is going to happen to them. They are asked to abandon their mobile phones because one of the ideas behind the Feuerle collection from the beginning is that it's a mobile detox zone. It's also very difficult to have a connection there, of course, but yeah. it's basically uh, also nice that you don't look into the screen of your mobile. They go, first of all, down. They suddenly find a very little door, and then when they enter in this door, through this door, it's completely dark. They are for two minutes and 40 seconds in the total darkness with music by John Cage, a very beautiful piece composed in 1953 for Merce Cunningham, called Music for Piano Number no. 20, selected by Mr. Feuerle, with the many versions of it, the longest one, the version which is having 11 notes and as many silences. People are in the darkness, they listen to these sounds, and they don't know what to expect. They are under the earth, with tons of concrete on their heads, but they're also in a dream, and then, when they go out, they see this. And they have uh, the most sensual and uh, synesthetic system of Khmer sculptures from the 7th to the 13th century, as I said before, representing Vishnus, Shivas, Apsaras, goddesses, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Avalokiteshvaras, and they have imperial Chinese furniture. What you see in the middle is an incredible piece from the Han Dynasty, one of the first pieces ever in the history of furniture from China. And all of this is there with a specific light design and space design. And when visitors walk through the exhibition, they are performers. They are not visitors of the museum. They are 
part of a performance. The coulisse, the choreography, has been designed by Mr. Feuerle with the assistance of John Pauzon, but actually entirely in the head of Mr. Feuerle. And, and then they walk through the space. They discover art pieces, but nobody is telling them what they have to look at. There's, there are no texts, there are no labels, and there are no actively guided tours. But we have very nice colleagues, experts on the, co on, the, on the collection, with a cultural background from Asia, Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, who know everything from first hand, from their family, from, from their own story, about uh, the religious contents and the aesthetics around these pieces, who can answer questions. So one has to activate them. They passively accompany the visitors. And then here you have one of the, basically one, it's, it's, it's difficult to say what is a favorite piece in a place like that, but I must say I'm, I have a very strong connection to this god because I, I have learned from Mr. Feuerle how important it was. It's also very early sculpture from the seventh century. It's a sun god, Ariara. He was both Vishnu and Shiva. He has half third eye on the on the forehead and has an incredible power and behind him you have what we call the lake room the lake room is a, an underground lake 2500 square meters 1000 hectoliters of crystal clear water we cool it down and it's a Perfect. It's like a crystal, like a like a mirror. It has been created for its beauty. It was uh, in the mind of Mr. Feuerle from the beginning because that bunker has a story with water. We know that on the 2nd of May, 1945, two hours before the general uh, uh, had given the, the the order to cease with the, with the, with the, any hostility. Um, the SS destroyed a tunnel under the Landwehr Canal, which was connected to another building of the Reichsbahn, and so the water entered. And in this building there was water when uh, Mr. Feuerle and, and, and Mrs. Puch discovered the building for the first time. But then it's also the water in the experiences of his life, going to Cambodia, going through Asia, and the idea that a labyrinth of water, mirrors, glass, shadows, lights, and sculptures will let everybody forget where they are, lose their direction, and enter a dream where maybe they will also go back at unexpected moments during the night or when they don't expect it and other times of their lives. And we heard it a lot from people. They keep on coming back. So... This lake also has the function. You saw the blue in the graphic that I had prepared before. It became the heart of the building on the energetic, or let's say clean energetic uh, level. Because the water is cooled down to three degrees. Underneath the water, there's a black foil protecting a very sensitive concrete layer. In the concrete layer, there are capillaries of a heat pump. And by cooling down the water, we attract the warmth of the earth, and then we channel it up and climatize the whole building. So from a very, very, very cold environment and very wet environment, which it was before, now we have perfect 19 degrees, 55% humidity, constant, perfect conditions for very delicate art pieces, international standards, museum standards, even for grand pianos. We know that it's exactly the same conditions to, to store the most expensive pianos in the world. But you also have the most beautiful art installation that you could imagine. The hand I, I just now go through so you have an idea. This is the incense room. When I said synesthetic, I was not saying it by chance. Synesthetic because the combination of all the senses, from the olfactory sense, the auditive sense, and the visual sense, and when we have events, also uh, the taste but also then the, up, the haptic, the tactile sense, because we have also meditation, so you can lay down on the floor. You are massaged by the gong waves when we make the gong meditation every first Saturday in the month. Well, the, all the senses are part of the Gesamtkunstwerk, of the total artwork, but the center of the Gesamtkunstwerk 
is the incense room. It's, it was one of the goals of, of Mr. Forle when he thought together with his wife to open this museum to integrate in the West an experience which has been super exclusive since 200 BC and actually only for emperors and high dignitaries and high monks and scholars from the Chinese court and open it to anybody who is interested to enter this world. He designed everything from the room to the table, which is a very special table made of African blackwood, to all the tools, integrated elements from the Khmer uh, heritage to the Chinese heritage and this very new table designed for him, with him, by John Pawson which is heating the incense. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I will go very quick. It's heating, heating the, the incense. I, something is not, yeah. Okay, these are the scenes from the incense ceremony. The, see, the, the table is heating the incense and you can have in very uh, short 50 minutes something that otherwise would, da would, would be two hours and a half of experience. And it's the, uni the only place in the world where you can do it. I go through, you have an incredible Naga Buddha, you have a very beautiful Anish Kapoor installation. I go up, Cristina Iglesias, Spanish artist, site-specific installation, the most sensual bronze sculpture you can ever see. You can sit around it, people do it and, and relax. Imperial cabinets, Adam Fuss, Araki. The sensual thread through the museum is omnipresent. It's the most important that people feel sensuality when they enter a place like that. First temporary exhibition opened last year, Edmund de Waal and unseen pieces from the Foyle collection. In the back, you have six Mon bronzes from the Mon kingdom, Burma, sixth century. And in the front, a very beautiful elegy by Edmund de Waal who is an incredible British uh, artist with a very complex European background. We are starting to use the Foyle collection for many other activities. Fashion shows, as you can see. Performances. We started this year with um, a program of performances curated by Mr. By Mr. Foyle, including a Ryukyu dance from the 14th century in the middle of a context of the bunker, contemporary art, and ancient imperial Chinese furniture. Incredibly beautiful. We have the gong bath, as I said. Every first Saturday of the month, people lay down and are massaged by the gong waves. And we are inviting and uh, welcoming many who want to have exclusive dinners there. So the place is alive. The energy you can breathe there is very different from what you would expect. This was the last event done by Armani during the film festival. And this is our team, and I'm, I'm done. I just want to say one thing. This, this miracle in a city like Berlin, which is very important for, uh, for the contemporary art scene, this miracle within the uh, contemporary art scene is only possible because of the founders, but also because we have an incredible team. We have like artists, Creatives coming from China, Japan, performers, masters of calligraphy, masters of the incense ceremony, masters of the tea ceremony, all together in one office. We work together every day. Everybody is welcome. Please come and visit us. Thank you. Hola. Hello, welcome to all of you and thanks for having invited me to be part of this um, seminar. This is the title of my presentation, Air Raid Shelters from an ephemeral construction to an eternal memory. Why this ephemeral construction? Because when shelters were built, it, it was something temporary. It had to be for a certain period of time. War wasn't supposed to last for so long. So it was easy that uh, these got forgotten because it was built, built for something temporary. But this is going to last or they lasted for decades and physically 
in the shelter, the shelter might remain, or the shelters also remain in documents, in papers, and this will remain forever. So the first part is the war. The bombing took the war to people's door because the front line was far away, but bombings came to people's doorsteps. What were bombings? Bombings were planes, cannons. Bombings have been going on for more than 300 years against civil population. Here we were talking in Barcelona about uh, Italian aircraft, but it could be the artillery in Madrid or other things. So this uh, aircraft uh, will attack the population, and there were dead people. This was the attack on February 13, 1937. And here we could see that the people of Barcelona were ready for everything except for bombs dropping upon them. Here we can see despair, walking without a destination with everything they had on them. This lady probably only the mattress. And that made the society, people to move, to mobilize. We think that we have to think that in Barcelona, and here you can see the beginning of this shelter, m most shelters were built by a civil society because the city of Barcelona only built 36 cell, uh, shelter, uh, shelters out of uh, 1,322. So the city built really very few uh, shelters. It was people who built the vast majority of shelters and people organized. And the building, here we can see the building of two air raid shelters in Gracia. They were built together in March 1937, but two months later um, they separated the people who um, build the uh, um, shelters, they divide it, and now they are going to be connected. In Gracia, during uh, the civil war, and according to the documents we have, 32 shelters were built in squares. These were public shelters. People built them so the neighbors could go down the shelter. And 37, uh, 87 that uh, belonged to neighbors or to families. These shelters would be the ones built in the neighborhood of Gracia. And we know now that uh, the city has divided uh, the city in different neighborhoods. So these shelters are located in what it is nowadays, the neighborhood of Gracia. But at that time, the neighborhood was bigger. This is the shelter in Revolution Square. The health care um, services were here. Once the war was over, we go into the second, um, what I call the second chapter, which is um, reuniting again. Someone has uh, said that uh, shelters were forgotten. I think here that people who had been in shelters wanted to forget then 
after the war. My father was sent to war when he was 17. The second day of being in the war, his friend was killed. My father didn't want to talk about the war. He didn't. Um, it, it's not that uh, the Francoism imposed that on him. It was himself that he didn't want to remember. So people didn't have lots of interest in shelters. And people thought, well, this, let's turn a new leaf. There is a writing which explains that uh, they sent a letter to the city council saying, we don't want to know anything about the shelter. But uh, the authorities at that time said, no, you have to look after the shelter. And it was in democratic times when these shelters reappeared again. In on October 1981, the shelter in Sola Square was reopened. That shelter was built by the city council. It was a cellular um, shelter. It was never finished, although maybe some people uh, took shelter there, even if the floor was uneven. The only the one that uh, was used of this can was in Tetuan Square. Here we can see Xavier in the picture, he was a councillor. He had the main role in opening this uh, solar square uh, shelter in 1981. At that time, no one was asking um, to protect these shelters. And in the end, that was demolished and a parking lot was built. In 1994, a parking was built in Revolution Square, and that allowed uh, for a shelter to be reopened here. Uh, there was a certain pressure by certain associations, and we managed that neighbors could visit the shelter. But and people started going down in an unofficial way. So when they opened the access, the workers uh, left when it was nighttime, and the neighbors took the wood or, or the things that were closed in the access and went down. But the authorities didn't change any archaeologists because they were not very interested in the shelter. So it was the Taller de Historia de Gracia, this association, who was very interested and ask for an intervention and for the shelter to be preserved. When this shelter was opened at the uh, Maxon in Verdi Street, a design institute, I was allowed to go into a factory shelter. And I was able to see that shelter. I could access through the factory. This was the entrance. I want to show you the entrance to that shelter in that factory. I saw that in 1994. And I asked the factory, Maxon. It was quite difficult to get the permit to go there and to take the picture. And in 2007, I was able to take pictures inside the shelter. In 1999, after a strong pressure by um, Pilar Frutos, um, we managed to open the shelter in the Amana Square. I had seen this shelter in the 60s when an electricity transformer was put in there, and I saw that there was a hole. In 1990, when there were some renovations going on in the square, the access to the shelter was found. And in finally, in 1999, 
the shelter was open. So here we can see the first entrance or access that the firefighters uh, did. And Pilar Frutos, the woman that you can see who was the person who really fostered the opening of this shelter. When we knew that uh, a parking lot was going to be built in Juanic Square, uh, we insisted a lot that we had to see, and, and we went there and said, if you are going to start drilling, um, well, you might have problems. So in the end, we did a field work, and we could find the entrance to the shelter. That was in 2001. Here you can see some archaeologists that were examining some remains of rubble and um, garbage too. Everything was important, but then we realized that there are things that can have a second life and others don't. But here we were picking up everything we could find uh, here. The walls here were stone walls. In 2002, I could go down to the shelter of uh, Elizalde factory. That day, you can see the gentleman in red. He lived in the uh, staircase giving access to the shelter. And uh, the rest are family members of a lady that granted me access to that shelter. Memory. Is this eternal memory? We have been asking for the protection of these shelters, and we have a catalog, and uh, this catalog was updated in 1998, and we managed to include air raid shelters under sea protection. That means that before destroying, it needs to be documented. We were the only neighborhood in Barcelona having this sea protection. So we're going to try to move on with our work. When the Plaza del Diamant shelter opened in 2006, after some works, we can see the visit on the first day to see the shelter. Then there were some guided tours, and finally, in 2009, the Atelier d'Historia de Gracia will take, be in charge of this shelter. In 2007, 307 shelter was open. Valerie Powell, uh, the woman who really um, fought for this, uh, the protection of this shelter, and the city council really mistreated her. But thanks to her, and now a square has her name, this uh, shelter uh, was made accessible to the public. Here we can see with the yellow helmet the mayor at that time, a councillor as well. The director of the History Museum of Barcelona. That was the day of the opening when visits started. Why have I shown the um, shelter in Plaza del Diamant with visitors and here with only politicians? Well, some things are done almost in a hidden way, and other things are made very officially. We have been fighting for a long time in Gracia neighborhood and in Pueblo neighborhood. There has really been a battle, and we have achieved things. In other neighborhoods, uh, the intensity of this movement has been a lot less. Let's go down the shelter of the Amana Square. In the Amana Square, there are two uh, entrances uh, in the surface. It has uh, mine galleries at 12.5 meters, labyrinth. 
170 people seated, that's the capacity, and 200 standing. Here we can see the um, health part. Uh, it, doesn't, it didn't have toilets, three more accesses going down. This is the shelter that uh, we're going to visit tomorrow afternoon. If you're ent interested, you can enroll and we will go down that shelter. If we talk about this shelter from a memory perspective, here we can see these uh, structures that were put in place at the beginning. Here we have writings from people who experienced the bombings and excerpts from the novel uh, Diaman Square. We are at the street level and here we have the interpretation center where it is explained the beginning of the bombings, the carriers, uh, air carri uh, plane carriers that came from Mallorca, passive defense, and the shelters and the Diamana Square shelter explanation. So guided tours are organized since 2009. And here you can see these guided tours. You can see 68,700 uh, uh, people visited since uh, from 2010 till 22. We have more and more visitors, and as we have seen in the um, German case during the pandemic, the number of visitors went down, and now we're going up. We haven't reached the peak of uh, 2000. Uh, 19, but 2022 has been a good year. Students from secondary and high school, over 20,000 students have visited the shelter with the corona pandemic. Uh, the number of uh, students went down. In uh, 2020, for the first three man months, we received lots of students, then everything stopped. In 2022, we had the biggest number of students students visiting the shelter in the Amman Square. Uh, individuals who come or a group, and that's over 40,000 people who have visited the Amman Square shelter, as you can see here in the graph. On the right, you can see when there is a drop, it was because of the financial meltdown. Uh, at that point, the number of visitors reduced, as well as with the pandemic. And you can clearly see these ups and downs. If we talk about the shelter in Revolution Square as a space for memory, the shelter is going to will open in August, next August. August, and here we can see the health uh, part or services of the shelters. Uh, these people were part of the Evro Army. That was a reenactment, and I took this picture. It was part of my book because I thought it was important to tell the story. The Elizalde factory shelter that we're going to visit tomorrow morning, too, it's an important shelter, too, because it was an industrial one. And it's a good example, even if it's a private shelter shelter, the people running the shelter or in charge of the shelter would like to open it to the public. 
In 2009, I published this book. At that point, there were not many books um, published on shelters in Barcelona. Yesterday, we were talking about the seminar that took place in 2009 at the Museum History. And in 2010, we celebrated a seminar as well uh, um, about different shelters in Catalonia. And we have recently published this book, Rutas de la Guerra Civil. It's in Spanish, and the uh, Diamant Square shelter is in the book, uh, the one in Turo de la Rubira. And to conclude, People who have visited our shelters, these are more than 60,000 people, the vast majority are people from Barcelona, from Catalonia, some from Spain, and few very much. And if you have uh, questions, I'm happy to answer them. I have a couple of blogs uh, as well about um, shelters in Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you very much to our four panelists, and I'm sorry if we have rushed you in, um, but I wanted to have time to reflect on what you have mentioned. I think the debate on memory is a live debate. The uses, the, uses, the experiences generate um, consequences on us. I had a thousand questions and after listening to you I have a thousand more but because we don't have a lot of time I would like to give you some time if you want to um, say something about what you've heard and if you don't have comments we will open up um, at first I want to thanks to all of the presentation which was very 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 interesting I learned a lot in those two days and my questions go straight to the Germans. <laughs> because of the difficulty of that mem this heritage, I will say. Um, to Kai Heine, my question would be to know how you deal when classes of students come, because I'm a history teacher, and um, with that memory of the Germans as a victims, and which is not in the official curriculum treated like that. So how is your approach and what is your, we talked about yesterday a bit, what is your real final goal in that guidance that you do um, without or trying, I don't know if you do that, not this, taking this position of victim. Is a victim. And um, just a comment to Maruka, because as a Buddhist with Muslim roots, <laughs> I found that really very interesting how you use that space, which is usually so full of pain, and put it in the darkness. And if you go there, your first idea is this panic, maybe, and you lighten that up in a very beautiful space. But my curiosity was who are the sponsors? You know, who paid all that? And. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because I guess not the city hall. <laughs> so, um, and who is the creator of that idea? And do you follow um, um, a movement of Buddhism or um, of a certain uh, philosophy? So, thanks. <laughs> especially, uh, uh, the school groups is a, is a special, um, a special target group, if you use these words. Um, uh, those kids are coming for, uh, today, um, except those who are coming uh, as, an, as um, uh, people who escaped um, the, the war in yeah, east of us, um, and, and I mean any place for that, um, they don't have personal experience with war, and ne neither their parents or their grandparents. Uh, so 
um, these, there is, um, what we experience um, is no living history, oral history in the families about war and about um, suffering um, through the war. And what we try to do in the tours is uh, we try to um, give them a whole picture, which is nice for us because it was 90 minutes uh, f for, for them. And so first we have to give them the, the prospect of the war and what happened. And we never mentioned forget who started this war. Um, and um, then how it could fight back to you, how it slapped back on you. And um, one of my colleagues here said, uh, the war, the bombs bring the war to your ha home, to a house door. And that's what happened. And then we tried to give them the ex experience, is a wrong word for that, but an, an, at least a feeling of what it was to be in a bunker, what it meant to be in bunkers. Um, what we not forget at this point is, um, and Wieland said that yesterday even too, we are talking about bunkers, shelters in a dictatorship situation, uh, in a racist situation. Uh, so even that, we try not to forget, uh, to, to give the, uh, that's a lot of stuff, a lot of history that the, the kids had to, had to take down at this point, That's, uh, we know that. And after 90 minutes, you can see when they go t so through the door, that uh, oh, <laughs> sun again, light again. Um, but what we get then back is um, a lot of um, nice emails, not so much, because unfortunately, if you get a, have a good experience, you, most often you don't say, wait, well, thank you, um, as a school kid. Um, but what we have is um, just recently we got an, um, um, a job, an um, appliance from a girl, now it's a woman, um, who was with her school 10, 15 years ago on, on one of the tours. And that's one of the reasons why the, she studied history and now she'd like to work with us. Super. So that's the a, a circle we must create um, and uh, that's what we try to do. Another thing I didn't mention that bef um, before, but um, we offer the tours in now seven languages. So if the people from, um, from Spanish-speaking countries, from the Fran French-speaking countries, from Denmark, from Netherlands, and they come to us with the school groups, then we try to give them these tours in their language. Which is sometimes a thing we have to discuss with the teachers, because the teachers think, okay, we go to Germany, you will learn German. But if you want to really experience a good tour, you need to know what you hear and not to try to translate the whole time. So and that's one of our aims, to, to, to um, not to, to make it an uh, exclusive German experience, but we're trying to be inclusive as possible. Uh, one thing we don't have a solution till now is um, what I uh, mentioned was here by my last colleague, um, the uh, inclusion of people with, um, uh, yeah, with disabilities. Uh, because all the, all the structures we have are, you can't go inside with a wheelchair. You have to, we have to step down, you have to step up. And so we have a lot of people, we, unfortunately, we have to exclude. And we're trying to, even to try to build up a program for these people, a virtual program, so they can't f f find it at home and uh, follow us through um, Zoom conferences, through the structures. Uh, that's things for the future for us to do. Um, we know that. That's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I will use uh, now rhetorically a chiasmos to answer. So I will start from the last thing he said and I will try to build up to your question. Um, so language actually plays a very important role in experiences in museums and um, we um, also um, include language of course, but not in, a, in with an actively guided tour. So it's more the way the interaction is found between the person accompanying and the public, which is always very unique, that leads then to the 
explanation of what is um, experienced inside of the museum in case somebody needs the explanation. And inclusion plays a very big role for us as well. Um, and our way to inclusion was actually to open the arms of a very lively community in Berlin, which is the Asian community, to people and, and the content coming from Asia in a Western institution to people who might not have had the chance yet to encounter uh, some of those aspects and uh, to find always not a preconceived way to answer things but to to look for the dialogue so passively accompanying and then answering questions and then going deeper if it's needed and then performance plays a big role in inclusion as well because the body language has a power in its own right and uh, the power of performance is also this and the whole experience is performative because of what I explained before and then going back to the concept who is the curator of, of this and what is the vision coming from which it's coming. So Desire Feuerle is a curator, he is the collector, and he's the designer behind all aspects at the Feuerle collection as a total artwork. So he's the founder of the collection itself, many years before um, the museum in Berlin was opened, starting from uh, his childhood, he was already working in an iconologic way, although of course it was a spontaneous, natural iconologic appro approach. He was combining in his mind, in his eyes, and in his experience um, elements from different cultures, Italian art, uh, contemporary art, Asian art, European contemporary art uh, with uh, objects, objets trouvés, with uh, silver, with so very, very diverse. He started from his childhood, he traveled with his parents, he discovered more and more the passion for collection, for collecting, and the love for Asia, and then he developed his specific knowledge as a connoisseur in, in London at Sotheby's, and in New York at Sotheby's, then working for Michel Werner, then opening his own gallery in uh, Cologne and starting to experiment as a pioneer in juxtapositions at the end of the 80s and early 90s and discovering that his soul is not only the soul of a gallerist but more of a curator and a collector for himself, for the art and also for other collections because he was working a, and he is working as a consultant for international collections. And um, his approach, his synesthetic approach, um, which is so open, and so I answer now, I try to answer now the question about the religion. Um, I would say um, the Ferle collection has a spiritual, deep spiritual openness to, the, to this very secret and very important um, um, relations, uh, um, um, connection in the soul of in the soul of human beings between human beings across the centuries. So it's possible for somebody nowadays walking through the Feuerle collection to feel contemporary of somebody who has created the Khmer sculptures in the seventh century. All art becomes contemporary again, and we are actually time travelers. This because. In his sensitivity, since a child, he didn't concentrate on the art historical elements primarily, also that is important, but not primarily that, but the emotional level which is making us all equal when we look at art. And in this sense, I would say it's a deeply spiritual place, but not exclusively religious of one religion. And. Um, and, and the openness is really total. So there's, there's not a boundary and it's inclusive. So this is the idea. And then I would like to say something answering the first question. Um, when a dream is really strong and you cannot live without doing exactly that, you find a way to create something impossible. And this is what happened. And it happened because of two people together because of a vision already existed and somebody who embraced completely this and opened because of 
specific knowledge, no? Because, I mean, I, st I talked about one of our founders, and then there's another founder, Sarah Pooj, mu museum director for many, many years in this city, in Barcelona, now president of the Miro Foundation in Barcelona, trustee, friend, um, art historian, studying in New York at the NYU, working at the MoMA. So a lot of knowledge together with another kind of knowledge created the possibility. So I would say it's not a financial question, it's a question of um, unendlich, of a never ending dedication. That is actually what created this place. And now it's open to everyone, we're looking for partners, we are happy to find partners, and I think um, it showed with a very diverse program that there are many ways to become partners. Thank you. I think there is another question. I think there was someone else. If not, I'm going to ask a question. We have five minutes left. We've been talking about uses and experiences which can be uh, very different. Emotional experience puts us on an, at the same level. And I would like uh, to tell us about your experiences. What is the main debate between giving meaning or turning things into a museum? And from your personal experiences, for instance, someone walking by a bunker and without noticing it, or some people who didn't go back, didn't want to go back to a bunker. So I would like to, you to say, how do we have to, what do you think about giving a new meaning? Or well, it's a very complicated topic. In Badalona, there is a shelter in front of the city hall that it's an exhibition place. Uh, we have many petitions um, to access the shelter to shoot horror movies, and I always refuse. And I would ask a question, um, would we turn um, the Opera House of Barcelona into a cemetery? Is that what we want? Or do we need, for instance, if a shelter is very narrow, are we going to turn this into sewage or are we going to use these places to uh, explain a story. Agramun has been mentioned, a place in Catalonia, in Catalonia, the shelter, if it had been bombed or not. Agramun was bombed because all of a sudden it became front line. And that was the front line for the war and was bombed. I think it's very difficult and we have to be cautious when we try to change the meaning of a memory space. We have to be very cautious. Yes. Um, so um, in our case it's a bit different because it's not, this space is not a public space, it's a private space and the building doesn't have um, per se for the population in Berlin um, an active significance before the the the, um, the founding of the museum uh, as a foyer collection. Um, but I would say that um, maybe I would not use the term monumentalization in this case, but I would use the second word, this re um, evaluation and recontextualization in uh, in terms of one of the main now uh, I would say nowadays but since many decades already main um, industries in the city of Berlin which is the art industry so um, the intervention has taken out of I would say maybe the 
ähm, Vergessenheit, der, ähm, ähm, ja, es ist der Forget, for, for, uh, forget, forget, forget yeah. being forgotten, out of this being, level of being forgotten or not known, and he's placing this place in front of the eyes of everyone, but in a very concealed and very discreet way, inside of, of the main discourse or the main industry now, the creative industry in Berlin, opening, to, opening it to all the disciplines. So it's possible to, when we have chances like this, which is so great, to open a new door and analyze another element. I must say, if now, would, we didn't have the time, but um, actually I prepared many other facts I wanted to share with all of you. One I will share now. Historically, this building could also be interpreted or be seen as a key to read some of the most complex um, moments in the history of the city of Berlin, because you might all know, but um, you, you know Berlin was divided, but you also might know that um, after World War II, um, the interpretation of property as to the properties of what was called the Reichsbahn was very diverse on the two sides of the city, uh, because in the GDR, they they maintained, for many reasons, also legal reasons, um, in order to be able to operate with the same railway system also in West Berlin, they maintained the old name Reichsbahn, which is actually linked also to the political situation of during the war. So in all the operations that you, we all know of reanalyzing the memory of what happened during World War II, keeping a name like that was quite a big, big decision. They had to do it or they did it in order to maintain control and the possibility to use the, net, the network of, um, of um, um, the railway network in West Berlin, operative. So it was a specific situation only for Berlin. Basically, the GDR thought that all the buildings belonging to the estate of the Reichsbahn, even if they were not in East Germany, when they were in West Berlin, they belonged to them. And there was a discussion about this, which was very complex because it was, they decided, it was the Cold War, we did, at a certain moment, you, it was difficult to take a position, <coughs> but the building has been used after uh, in the 50s for a short period, period of time, but quite significant as a Zenatsas have. It's a, it's a storage of the Senate of West Berlin, although the East German government thought it was their property. They never accepted it was not their property. And Reichsbahn existed in the East. There was a, another society dealing with the former heritage of the Reichsbahn in the West of Berlin, which was trying to substitute it. It Through the Senate, suddenly, they had the authorization to use it. And they used it for a short period of time to have reserve the, the storage of goods in order to resist during the Cold War against them. So it was a, it's, it's a, like a very complex system, you know, and this building could represent this. But still, it's not a landmark. Now it became one of the, I would say, um, places of discussion, of a rediscussion of the vision towards art for this 21st century in Berlin, because it's a new access, new approach, a new vision, it's not uh, negating that the rest should exist, not at all. And Berlin has a very complex system of museums. I, and I think you also know the Humboldt uh, Forum is an incredibly important pole of discussions, positive, negative, you know, ar around many other uh, uh, aspects for art not coming from Europe and the colonialist past and so on. So in all this, plus all the contemporary art scene and the performance scene and so on, the Feuerle collection is using the contents to put together everything and every now and then aspects of this, mu of this building and its history and maybe it's mo possible monumentalism come out. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's a, it's a floating and um, organic development.
Uh, yeah. Um, actually, I have to say you taken a competitor <laughs> comp uh, of the of the of the, of the game. <laughs> because you, you, you choose to not to use this as an historic place, but an, an art place, yeah. which is uh, what I've seen now, but I've never been the chance to come in. You're sold out every time. Tomorrow, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you, you, we take you there next okay. time. <laughs> um, so what I've seen till now from you and uh, what I've heard from, from my colleagues who have been there is uh, it's an impressive way to use this place. And then, and, then, and then we way to imagine uh, to use this kind. Um, when you, um, when you, uh, at the moment when you started, you, um, you said that it looks like, an, like a piece of land art. Um, and that's when a moment where I smiled, uh, please don't say that to the architect uh, <laughs> of the bunker, uh, because they do that um, because they don't want to go to war uh, to the front um, at this moment. Um, for us, um, in difference to using that as an art, and or in difference to, to uh, we learn to use that as an, I can't say a real museum, um, where they have exhibitions. Um, uh, what we do is we try to always to um, come to shelter the moment we have now. We try to, if there are layers from the back, from the past, we try to show them, and we try to to bring this place we have to as, as possible as near to its original time stamp, so the people could experience the the past. That's what we try to bring in. And so, on a, in a way, we musealize these. So we, we near, we going near to be a museum. But these places we have, it's no museums. They're not. They're, they're speaking, but you have to listen. And therefore, we do in tours. Uh, so we, so one time every two years, and that will be in June. Uh, we make in the long night of the Unterwelten. So we open all the places we have, and then you can go in freely. And my colleagues are just standing there, and like a little bit like on your. Uh, if if you ask them, they will uh, don't stop talking, <laughs> but they shouldn't. Um, so you can experience this, this, the places by yourself. Uh, but normally, the normal way we try to deal with that is we try to uh, conserve them as the best way as possible, and we try to explain them while you experience them, while you go inside, while you are there. You will hear some of these structures are in the subway, so you hear the subway next to uh, you, over you, under you. Uh, you feel the vibration, um, or you're feeling uh, trapped because you, you you don't have any experience from the outside. Um, so that's what, what, what I think it's the experience of making a tour with us is, uh, is, is a thing we'd like to have. Thank you very much to all of us. Thank you for inviting me to chair. The Thank you.